Here we go. So no matter where Jacob goes, he's being tested. And I think we can expect the same thing. As we progress in our walk, um, when you know more, you're obligated with more. And that's how you grow. That's how you're constantly tested. It's, it's a state of perpetual growth. And where am I getting that? Well, I think, obviously, the situations, not just with Abraham, who's constantly being tested, with Isaac, who continues to be tested, but here with Jacob, who continues to be tested. But I think our tip today is going to be found in the donkeys, um, the different types of donkeys. In the last tour portion, we talked about, you know, the, the donkeys that, that carried the medicines, the, the substances of healing for the relationship between Joseph and his brothers and even his father, because Jacob is the one who's actually directing them specifically what things to take to this man who is demanding to see the face of Benjamin before he reveals himself to them. Now, they don't understand that's the whole point, is the revelation that I am your brother. But he says, you won't see my face again until you bring me your youngest brother. And we brought out the point last night that Benjamin was the only brother born in the land. The rest of them are born outside of the land. And so he's, he's saying... I want to see the face of the one, the favorite of his father at this point, because Joseph is gone. And by this point, there's been a change in Judah. Because he's experienced the loss of two of his own sons, now he tells Joseph, I couldn't stand to see the distress of my father if we were to return without Benjamin. Whereas before, it didn't bother him too much to put his father through the distress of a lost son. Now he says, I couldn't stand that. I couldn't bear it. I simply couldn't bear it. And that's the heart of Messiah, but that's also the heart that has to be in us. Because sometimes we have walked with brothers and sisters, whether our own family or, you know, the body of Messiah. And because of where we were in our life at that time, it just didn't bother us when they dropped off the wagon. In fact, our attitude was kind of like good riddance. You know, that's <laughs> tattletale. They're just going to go tell daddy if I do something wrong. Um, they think they're better than I am. They, they're constantly, you know, trying to take control of situations. They're trying to run the Passover Seder. They're trying to run Sukkot. They're trying to run the Torah study. Um, just little smart Alex like Joseph. And when those people kind of drop out of sight, we're kind of like, Whew, glad they're not here anymore. <laughs> you know, they were nothing but trouble. But then as we grow older, we realize, yes, it was in the Father's will for a season for them to drop off that wagon. But something that was brought out, I think, in our own Torah study at our congregation on Shabbat, was it was when Jacob saw the wagons that he believed it was actually Joseph who sent them. And there was some symbolism in those wagons that we'll get into when we get into the book of Vaikra, because the Levites are given wagons in order to perform their service. So there is some prophecy and some prophetic symbolism in those wagons that I believe, again, in paleo prophecy, Jacob sees those wagons and he responds to that. But the donkeys, remember, they, they were that those 10 donkeys, which constitute a minion. And then we also talked about, um, especially when we did the chapter on donkeys, dreams, and crack cream, how the donkey represented the human being, the soul, the nefesh of a human being. And that's why even a donkey, the firstborn of a donkey, has to be redeemed with a lamb. Why? Because it's our symbol. It's what we identify with as human beings. It's teaching us about prophecy. And that prophetic symbol was so important to the spiritual life of Israel that the firstborn of a donkey even had to be redeemed with a lamb or you had to break its neck. One or the two. 
And in last night's class, we talked about the play on words because we went through in workbook two, the conversation that Yeshua has with Peter. Shimon, the hearer, Peter. And remember, Shimon, it's the hearer. And if it drives us back to this story of the brothers and the relationship with Joseph, it's Shimon who's put into prison, I believe, for three days. And then in the passage, passages that we looked at with Peter first, when he realizes Yeshua said, you will deny me three times before the cock crows. And then he realizes that's exactly what he did. He denied him three times before the cock crowed. And then it says he went out and he wept bitterly. And we compare that to Joseph who wept three times in the process of revealing himself to the brothers. And in fact, that last time he wept so loudly, it said even Pharaoh's household could hear it. It was so loud. And sometimes there's tears of bitterness, like Peter, when he realized I did exactly what he said I would do. And I said, I would never do. I denied him three times. He wept bitterly. But that, that third weeping with Joseph it was relief, I believe. It was the joy of reconciliation. There's two kinds of tears that we can cry. And, you know, it talks about sowing in tears. But then when the sheaves come in, Joseph has his dream of the sheaves being bound. When those sheaves finally are reconciled, he's still crying. But it's tears of joy because it's tears of reconciliation. And in that reconciliation, it was these donkeys who bore the burden of the medicine, even though it's pistachios and balm and myrrh and resins and things like that in the natural realm. Each of those, if you remember from that Torah portion, represented something in a spiritual realm, some element of things some element of reconciliation. So they were meaningful. So donkeys. And in that lesson, we talked about the chamor, donkey, which is the one that has to be redeemed because it's the domestic donkey. We talked about the para donkey, which is the wild donkey, uh, the untamed donkey, these um, described as basically running over the hills, you know, um, unrestrained. And again, it represents our nefesh. It goes back to that requirement that it be redeemed. Our soul has to be redeemed by a lamb. A donkey, which is a nefesh, a soul, has to be redeemed by a lamb. That's the thing we have in common with a beast. We both have a soul and we both have a body. What that soul of the donkey does not have, though, is the same spirit of Elohim that was placed in us because we are of a different kind. And we conform ourselves to the image of Elohim. Even though we have that visible outward aspect, we have that outer garment that would tell an unbeliever, well, we're no different from a donkey or an ape or a snake. We know that we are different. We are not snakes. We are not donkeys. But we do have a soul. We do have a nefesh. And so that donkey becomes that symbol to show us how the nefesh, the soul of a human being, must be humbled it gives you the example of a donkey that is not humbled. It's that wild donkey. It's the para. It's Esau. It's Ishmael, the wild ass of a man, it calls him. Why? Because he won't bear the burden. If you're going to be a bondservant in the kingdom, then you have to put your shoulder to the burden. And if we have the testimony of Yeshua, then we're told that's the spirit of prophecy. And a lot of times we study prophecy as something separate from the word or the Torah. 
And prophecy is based in Torah. For everything we've looked at so far, just in the book of Bereshit, in every single lesson, we can say we have found paleo prophecy. We have found prophecies or seeds of prophecy that were later expanded upon. Like last night, I took them, I finished the PowerPoints that I started with you guys last week. I finished that presentation. And what it was was just a progressive study of the shepherd that's mentioned in this week's Torah portion. That's part of that answer of who are these because in the context of Jacob blessing Ephraim and Menashe, he says, who are these? Well, he's already acknowledged that it's the shepherd who has preserved me from all evil. So he precisely says the shepherd. So when he says the shepherd in this blessing, if we want to understand Joseph's children and the blessing that was placed upon them and how they were incorporated into the tribes, of Israel, then we go back and we study shepherd all the way from Abel to the end of the book, which takes a lot of time. Now, obviously, we didn't go through every single shepherd scripture, but we did some significant ones, and that's the hard work you really have to do for prophecy, understanding of prophecy to emerge. And then it made sense because we have this seed prophecy of the shepherd coming from Abel, coming from Rachel, the shepherdess, coming from Jacob, who points out in this little speech that Rachel died on account of me. Sometimes it's translated to my sorrow, but the word there is alai. He's saying Rachel died on my account. It was something to do with me that made her die. We think, oh, she died at childbirth. Well, she did. But Jacob says the reason that she died in childbirth was because of him. And so in last night's class, we talked about, was it really about the idols that she took from Levine? Or was it because she was part of Jacob and part of the promise and part of the blessing? And in order for her children to ever be recovered from the nations, where again, the question would be asked by Rachel, who are these? Who has begotten me these? These these don't really, (laughs) where do these come from? Well, they had to be scattered out there. That was part of the prophecy. And then we can go to prophets like Micah, who's prophesying about the seven shepherds. Then we can go to the Gospel of John, where Yeshua is being challenged. If you're really the Messiah, say so. And the whole context of that question has to do with shepherds and hearing the voice of the good shepherd, and then tying it into Yeshua saying, there's more sheep out there. They're not of this flock, but they're going to be in one fold eventually. We follow that back to our paleo prophecies in the Torah. Then we're truly studying prophecy. We don't start with Daniel. We don't start with Ezekiel. We don't start with Revelation. We started with Abel when we started studying the shepherd. Mm -hmm. And so donkeys play an important part in prophecy. We've already looked at them once in a lesson, but we want to add another donkey to our repertoire. (laughs) In your repertoire of donkeys so far, uh, you have the chamor, which is the domestic ass, the, the the beast of burden that will serve. And you have the pere, If you're transliterating it, it would be probably P-E-R-E or P-E-R-E-H, Pere. That's the wild ass. Um, He does not serve. He does not bear a burden. And this week, we want to add another one. We want to add a female ass. Because it's very important in the prophecy of Messiah And it's very important in the blessing on Judah. Because if Judah is giving this blessing of being the holder of the scepter, in fact, it says it's between his feet. Um, 
And we know feet also represent the nefesh, if you've never thought about that. Think about the scepter, the royal scepter of Judah. It doesn't say it's between his hands. It says it's between his feet. Now, can that have something to do with constellations and so forth? Sure, it can. But because we study even body parts as they relate to prophecy, we know that the feet do not just represent the good news, but they also represent the heel, which we know is associated with Esau, which is the red one, which is also that nefesh, the soul that says, give me some of that red stuff. All right, it's your appetite, your emotion, your desire, and your intellect. So in order to understand how the nefesh, the soul of a man, has to be subjected to the ruach, the spirit of the man, when we look at the feet, it's the lowest part of our body. It's the part that comes into contact with our, our basis substance, the earth, right? But the head represents the spirit because it's the part that's inclining, it's reaching, it's trying to reach up and connect with its source, which is the Ruach Adonai, the Holy Spirit of Adonai. That's where our spirit came from. And so the head is the, the symbol there. So the scepter is even between Judah's feet, which is the basest part of the human body. It's the lowest part. What does that say? Judah will be eventually, not always in history, but eventually Judah is going to have very tight control over his nefesh. That's going to make him stand out from the other brothers. Now Joseph, on the other hand, in long-term prophecy, he actually starts acting like a wild bull. <laughs> He starts goring the nations, it says, to the ends of the earth. And again, you can see the contronym. What can a bull do? It can be domesticated. It can do the good work of bearing the burden. Or it can be a wild bull. And um, I don't remember which book I put that in, but I, I compared the two types of bulls that were associated with Joseph to help us understand. And one of the bulls that he's compared to is, was for a long time thought to be mythical, but it's real. It was just so huge and so strong. Nobody thought it could be, you know, like they're making that up. And then they start finding the bones and the remains of these uh, arochs. They said, no, it was a real animal. So this blessing on Judah, um, Let's go back to page, I think I'm in the newer version. I don't know if this is, no, this may be the old version. Anyway, I'm on page 287 of Vayechi, and it's the introduction. If you've got one with a different page number, because I want to read this passage in Genesis 49, starting with verse 8. It says, Judah, your brother shall praise you, and we know that that's his name. You know, he will praise. That's, that's living your name. And he's saying, Judah, you're going to live up to your name. You've had this transformation. You have suffered the loss of your sons um, in a situation where you could have put your daughter-in-law to death and hid yourself from the shame of what you did. You spoke up and said, she's more righteous. And so Judah has been broken to the point that now he's willing to serve. And so Judah, he says, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Now, right there, if we've been following the story of Joseph, we should pause and say, huh? Wasn't that Joseph's dream that his brother's? would bow down to him because their sheaves bowed down and their stars bowed down to him, even his parents. 
That's what Jacob asked him. Are you telling me that your mother and I are going to bow down to you? Is that what you're saying? And so it looks as though either somebody's changed his mind or we might be getting a hint at something else that's very important in Scripture. And it goes back to if you're in this class for any length of time, sometimes you, you figure out when I ask a question, probably 80% of the time the answer is yes. Because it's not an either or question. I, I don't want you to ever get in a position where somebody can use mind manipulation on you and set you up with a false dilemma where you believe that there's only two choices. And in scripture, there's usually way more than two choices unless we're talking about sin or not sin. In that case, there's two choices. It's either sin or is it isn't, because Torah defines sin. But in a lot of other things, and we're not even talking about gray areas, we're just saying different aspects of the same thing. And we have trouble wrapping our minds around that because we're working so hard to separate ourselves from that which is not true. And then we carry it too far and all of a sudden, we're creating artificial choices that really don't exist. And so we don't have to ask the question, well, are the brothers supposed to bow down to Joseph according to his dreams and Jacob's interpretation? Or are the brothers supposed to bow down to Judah? What's the answer? Yes. And here's the reason why. Remember our menorah, and it's based on, because we know the seven spirits from Isaiah 11, where it talks about the Ruach Adonai, or the spirit of Adonai, it says the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, and reverence. And that's mind-blowing. You say, well, how can there be seven spirits if there's only one Holy Spirit? I mean, that's the whole statement of faith. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He's just one. Or is he seven? But see, it's just one piece of beaten gold. Originally, you start with one piece. What do you do? You hammer out seven aspects or seven manifestations of that one thing, but they are not separate from one another. If you were to try to break off a branch, then you've destroyed what it is. We try to do it sometimes. Have you ever run into people who all they could ever talk about was power? Right? Or you've talked to some people and all they really wanted was understanding. All they really wanted was the answer to the either or questions. But they don't want to talk about knowledge because that's sacrificial love. Who wants to lay down his life for a friend? You mean that's one of the seven spirits, you bet. Sacrificial love. It's not just knowing something. It's sacrificing and it's experiencing something. Making that ultimate sacrifice. So we do tend to try to, if not break them off, sometimes we do twist them around and hang on to one really hard, right? Because we like that one. That one appeals to us. But you can't do that. You have to accept all seven. If you want understanding, then you have to accept wisdom first. If you want wisdom, you have to realize that eventually that's going to lead to counsel. And counsel is not the counsel you give, it's the counsel you receive. You have to meekly receive the engrafted word. And that's what the earth does. We're human beings. We're made of earth. We are designed to receive good counsel. Now, in turn, as you mature, you will be able to give counsel. But you have to receive way more than you give in that case. And that's one instance where it is more blessed to receive than to give. Because often the giving really isn't coming from a spiritual realm. It's coming from the realm of the soul, the nefesh the earthly desires. And that's why James says we have quarrels. He said, doesn't, or doesn't it arise from your lusts? It's not arising from the spirit. 
the spirit's going to create a sense of peace and unity because of the unity, one Holy Spirit, seven manifestations. So Jacob has 12 sons. So my question is, are they 12 tribes or are they one Israel? Yes. Yes. Now, are there blessings that will be more apparent among each of the tribes? Well, absolutely. He wouldn't go to the trouble to describe them if they weren't important, if um, they wouldn't have a special blessing in a certain aspect. But if we say this blessing only applies to this tribe, then what do we do with this scripture, which is giving an identical blessing, one based on a dream and this based on a blessing. So it's Joseph, your brothers will bow down to you. And it's Judah, your brothers will bow down to you. But they are one Israel, even the 12 tribes. What does that tell us? We can look at the blessings on the 12 tribes that Jacob gave or that Moses later, he doesn't just... Um, affirm them, sometimes he gives us more information when Moses blesses them. Or Moses will try to rectify maybe something that Jacob left out. Jacob made some mistakes. You realize a lot of the Torah is fixing mistakes that Jacob made <laughs> and Isaac made and Abraham made. And so they were fallible human beings. And the Torah comes along and says, okay, don't marry sisters, don't do this, don't do that, fix this. And so with the tribes, I can say, okay, Judah has a special blessing of praise. Does that mean that no other person in any other tribe can praise? Or does it mean that no one in any other tribe will ever be worthy of praise? Absolutely not. That's where we get into, it's not an either or. We share in the blessings because we're one family. But the assignment is made by Jacob here because we want to know who should take the lead. Who should be the one who steps out? And when Joseph has his dream, he is going to be one who will eventually have to step out and take the lead of reconciliation. But at the very same time that Joseph's being dealt with in prison, Judah's over here being dealt with by losing his sons, by hitting some bad circumstances. And it breaks him. Just like Joseph is broken, and basically, he becomes like that weaned child. He just kind of gives up, like they've all forgotten about me. This is where I am. And Judah now is broken, and he can no longer accept the suffering of a family member. He's not willing to do that anymore. And so he also is being prepared to take leadership. Leadership and praise. And it's praiseworthy. To take the lead. If that's your blessing, if that's your gift, then it's praiseworthy. Just like it says, you know, those who take hold of the Torah, she's a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and those who support her are praiseworthy. So it's not as though you can say, oh, you know, don't say anything nice about me. Don't fall for it either. When people tell you nice things about you, your first question should be, yeah, and what do you want? <laughs> what do you want from me? <laughs> Why am I so wonderful to you? <laughs> but sometimes you are ministering to a need within another person. And it's not as though they're giving you praise like you're God. They're simply telling you they appreciate your being a servant, like Judah was. Judah's brothers didn't praise him because he held the scepter, they praised him because he became a servant. Judah was the one who drew near to Joseph at the risk of his life. And if someone says, thank you, you've ministered to a need, you've helped, you know, 
you've helped me hear from the Lord in this area. You've been an instrument. Then understand they're, they're not making you God, but it's like Judah, when you fulfill your role, when you walk in your blessing and you walk in your, your gift, it's praiseworthy to do that. Because when you don't walk in your gift, like the tribe of Dan later on, somebody else has to step in and take that place. If you think of it, Reuven, Reuben, he didn't step up. Okay, so let's go to the next brother. Let's go to Shimon. Shimon just wants to kill people and animals. <laughs> That's really what he's after. <laughs> and he wants to torture them before he gets around to it, right? And Jacob says, Shimon and Levi, don't let me enter into their council. You know, I don't ever want them to be the judges in a court where I'm being tried. So Shimon, he basically does not take leadership. These brothers are present when Joseph is thrown into the pit. They all have an opportunity to stop it. Reuben doesn't stop it. He just says, I'll do it the easy way. I'll come back when they're not here. Instead of taking the leadership role and saying, no, I'm the oldest and we're not doing this. He's kind of that, uh, you know, KG Christian or uh, <laughs> a lot like Lot. I'll just sit here and keep my mouth shut and be vexed by their behavior, but I'm not going to step up and, and say too much. So when they finally do, like with Lot, when he did finally speak up, they're ready to kill him. But you have to start out from the beginning. You have to take action when you see a wrong being done. When it's time to walk in your gift, to stand upright, Reuben didn't do it. Shimon didn't do it. Levi's just going to do what Shimon does because they're a, a terrible two, right? So then comes Judah. Well, even Judah doesn't step up at first, and we've just been going down the line. And so for all these years that Joseph is missing, the only one that we get any information about is Judah. And we always say, well, why is this Judah story right in the middle of Joseph's? Because it's showing you that two brothers are being dealt with. That it's going to be Judah who brings the reconciliation, not just with the whole family, but so that Joseph can see the face of Benjamin. There's going to be a revelation that involves Benjamin, the only son that was born in the land. What that's going to look like, I don't know. But it's prophecy. So it's two sons with similar blessings. He says, Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. I know there's all sorts of debate out there about who or what Shiloh is. It's a literal place where the tabernacle stood, and you can still go there to see exactly where the tabernacle stood. The, the old walls are still there. They're, you can see the outlines of them, because it eventually moved from being a complete tent to the the backsides, they're actually having rock walls to them that backed up to it. So it's a literal place, but it's also a prophetic thing. And some people say, well, Shiloh's already come because Yeshua's already come. But we still have part of the prophecy yet to be fulfilled. And this is what stands between Judah and those who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. The obedience of the peoples. In other words, the regathering of the tribes, they're looking for that. They don't see that yet, but they're beginning to. Some are. And they're saying, extinguishing or wiping out the red one, that spirit of Esau. In fact, it seems to be growing stronger, not weaker. They expect Messiah to take care of that and to rule with the rod of iron 
And like it says here, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And Yeshua speaks about this in the book of Revelation, how he will um, be given authority by the Father. And in turn, to some of us, he says, and I will give you authority, just as the Father has given it to me, I'll give it to you. But he will rule with a rod of iron. So prophecy has been fulfilled, and it is being, continuing to be fulfilled. So that tells you that Judah still has a leadership role, which goes back to everything that we learned from the beginning of the creation. Day four was characterized by governing and leadership. That's the birth order of Judah, four. And then it goes on. He has kind of a long blessing. It says, he ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull, or in some translations it says red, or flashing from wine, and his teeth white from milk. Now, there's a problem with that passage, and I think we talked about it when we did the tour portion last year. The last thing you would ever do if you knew anything about a donkey, a donkey cult or a horse cult, you would never tie this animal to a vine. A vine is not strong. In fact, that's just asking for trouble. Because a young colt is startled by everything. He's strong. He doesn't like to be tied. That's why when, when we bred horses, I always started halter breaking them when they were three days old. Why three days old? Because I didn't want them killing me when they were six months old. <laughs> you don't wait till they're six months old to tie them up. You start getting them used to that restraint when they're still small enough that it's not going to require shoulder surgery when you're done. If you know anything about donkeys or horses, this passage doesn't make sense unless it's prophetic, unless it's talking about the character and the nature of Judah. And if it's the character and the nature of Judah, then who else should it characterize? Us. We're one tribe. We're 12 tribes, but we're one tribe, right? We're of the kind of Messiah. And we follow after him. So Judah's blessing can also be our blessing. Judah's characteristics of praise, of being a guardian, and that's basically the connection I want to make between Issachar and Judah, is they both have very protective characteristics. In Judah's case, he's described as a lion, and it says, who dares rouse him up? You don't want to rouse him up. But then it, it goes over, okay, now we're going to start talking about donkeys, and you say, all right, is he talking about a colt here, or is he talking about a full-grown donkey? Because if you tied a full-grown donkey to a vine, it might stay there. They're already broken, um, domesticated. They worked long enough that they're just glad to have the rest if you tie them up there. Not a colt. It's completely out of character. But if we're talking about this cult's mother, and we, we looked at that prophecy last night in class last night about how Messiah would ride in on a she-donkey and the foal of the donkey. And that was my question. So is it the female donkey or is it the cult? Yes because both of those are going to be prophetic of the nature of Messiah. And taking us back to these paleo prophecies and the Torah, where this descendant of Judah, this lion, as he's later going to be called, the lion of the tribe of Judah, not only is he going to be this royal lion that people are afraid to rouse up, which apparently at this point in history, we're not that afraid of rousing him up. Uh, in fact, that seems to be the whole point. How far you can go before Messiah does come and wipe out a third of the people. 
um, you just feel the taunting that's going on all around us. Everything is screaming, there is no God. And we say there is no God, and we know there is no God, because no matter how wicked we act, nothing happens. So if there was a God in heaven, he would stop this. And he doesn't, so there must not be a God. So we must be God. That's the prevailing attitude today. But if we are to counteract that attitude, then we have to understand that we have the heart of a lion in us. We have a soul of praise in us. And we have the humility and the willingness to bear a burden of a donkey tied to a vine when it's against everything within our nature to stay tied to that vine. What did Yeshua say? I'm the vine. You're the branches. Okay. We're tied to the vine. We're tied to Yeshua. And that means it's against our very nature. If we're this young cult to run, to break the rope, to not be patient. If you've ever watched horses, um, at a horse show, um, they're all jazzed up because there's maybe hundreds of other horses around and they might be tied to a trailer. And I had a colt like this one time, I had a two year old and you know, he knew it was show time and he would stand there right up until we got the saddle on him. And what would he do? He'd just paw, he'd dig two ditches by the time we got the saddle on him. Why? Because he's raring to go. He's pulling on that rope. Let's go. This is fun. And there's girls here. You know, <laughs> that was mostly it. You know? <laughs> we got girls here. <laughs> and they will. They'll, they won't just stand there. They'll do everything in the world. Pa, shake their heads, pull back, play games with the rope, nip at people going by. But they would, if they were tied to a vine, they would never just stand there. They would have to be tied to something solid. And then they still don't want to be there. So what is he telling us? If we have the nature of Messiah, if we have the heart of Judah, then even when our nature is telling us, Pa, throw your head around, nicker at all the guys or gals, <laughs> walking behind you, chew a hole through the threads of the rope. Everything in our nature is saying, I don't want to be here and I don't want to be tied to this vine because there's way too much fun stuff going on around me. In spite of that, we stay tied to the vine. We don't pull. We don't paw. We don't bite. We don't dance in place because we would rather be somewhere else, we stand right there against everything that our soul is saying. Because why? Because the Spirit is telling us, be still. Be still, my soul. Be silent, my soul. Because the time will come to rise up. The time will come to be the lion. But... What comes first? It's the humble ass. It's the donkey that's willing to be tied to the vine like Yeshua. He rides in on a symbol of humility first. And you can see the order. Remember the, the natural and the spiritual. Right? So the first thing we have to do to counteract the natural realm is to have the heart of a donkey the heart of a servant, the one who's willing to stand there and serve when you would much rather be out on the mountains with the wild asses doing whatever you want to do. And then that spiritual is revealed, the heart of a lion, the one who lies down and waits because see the lion also lies down and waits until the proper time. And it says, who dares rouse him up? Because when the lion finally gets up, what do they say down south? Is Katie bar the door? <laughs> and I don't know why it's Katie, and I don't know why she has to bar the door, but <laughs> um, 
that's the nature, that's the transformation that we have to have. And we know that, let's go to Zechariah 9 9, because time passes so fast in this class. I want for you to be able to break down the nature of this donkey that we're talking about so we can see Yeshua in it. And so I flipped over to page 289, or you can just go to Zechariah 9 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, Yeshua. He's humble and mounted on a donkey. And in that sentence, or in that donkey, what's translated as donkey, that's the chamor. Chamor. And remember, chamor is the domestic donkey. That's the donkey that has to be redeemed by a lamb. So our salvation, our Yeshua, we can identify this king, we can identify this lion. Because this lion, this king, this Yeshua, he's going to be humble. We'll know he's humble because he will ride into Jerusalem, the city of the great king, mounted on a chamor, a humble domestic servant. And then it says, even on a colt. And that word is ayir. Ayir. I almost wondered if the Winnie the Pooh rider, you know, Eeyore, well, it would probably be the same, even though it's an English name. Ayir. You're, it's a donkey. Uh, somebody might have been playing with some words right there, but quite honestly, that's how I remember that word. <laughs> because I remember Eeyore, <laughs> the, the donkey. So it's on this young donkey, this Ayer, and then it clarifies it. It says the foal son, Ben, of a donkey, Aton. Right? So we've got three different kinds of donkeys in one sentence. We've got the domestic donkey, the chamor. We've got the colt, the ayir. And then we've got donkey, aton. If you're transliterating, that would be A-T-O-N. Three different kinds. Now, why does he have to use three different kinds of donkeys to describe Messiah? Well, again, he's trying to, to help us not understand and recognize Messiah when he comes, but to understand who we should be. If we are following in Messiah's footsteps, if we're going to be the sheep that hear his voice, you realize donkeys are also shepherds? You know how many, ask a cattle rancher, why would you have a donkey with your herd? because the donkey will protect the herd. We used to have a, a mini jack, and he didn't even have a herd, and he still protected his area. He protected this, this house, our property. If someone drove onto our property, whether it was the mailman pulling up in the driveway, you could hear him for at least three quarters of a mile because my neighbor would tell me. <laughs> He would let out this big hee-haw that lets you know, hey, something's going on out here. Donkeys can be very protective. You put them in with a herd of sheep, you put them in with cattle, and what will they do? They will protect those cattle. In fact, I had to keep telling some of these cattle farmers, we had a drought several years ago, they kept trying to buy them from me to protect the cattle because the coyotes were coming out of the woods and killing calves. They were running out of food. I said, you don't understand, that's as big as he's ever gonna be. And a Great Dane's bigger than him. <laughs> so he couldn't protect himself against coyotes, but a full-size donkey does a very good job of running away predators from a flock or from a herd. So what is a donkey? He's humble, he's a servant, He's a protector. 
he's patient, he acts against his wilder nature, which to us, again, is that picture of the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit inside of us, subjecting the soul, the appetite, the emotion, the desire, the intellect. And now we've added a new donkey, like I say in our resume, and the root of the Aton donkey, it comes from this root Aton, which means to continue. And it has several definitions other than just like in a verb form to continue. It means to be patient. Something that's perpetual, it's ongoing, it's ever flowing, it's constant, it's reliable. It's perennial. It's just like the flowers you never have to replant because they come up faithfully every spring. It can mean an ever-flowing stream. Remember um, Solomon, it talks about completing the temple in, or yeah, completing the temple in the month of Etanim. Etanim. You say, well, when did he start naming the months? I thought they were just numbered. So are they numbered or do they have names? Yes, because that name tells you something about that month. In Tishrei, we have Sukkot and we have the water pouring ceremony. And again, prophetically, that's telling you, Yeshua is telling you at the water pouring ceremony that, that this water is going to flow again once more out from under the throne. And he's identifying himself with that process that we first saw back in the rivers of Eden and Genesis. So he's taking us again back to paleo prophecy. He's identifying the temple with this process. The temple is in Jerusalem. And so in Tishrei, this stream begins at the Feast of Sukkot. But it continues, and we'll, I don't know if we have time, but the, the passages are in here. Um, it continues into the next month, which is Etanim, which is where we get this idea of a perpetually flowing stream. So the river that starts running through us at Sukkot in the very next month, Etanim, we realize it's not going to stop. It's a perpetually flowing stream. That's the, the idea to have the female donkey and why she would be included in this prophecy. And again, the donkeys associated with the tribe of Judah, but also with Issachar. There's something there too. So, an ever-flowing stream. It also means to be permanent and enduring. And as we go on to the book of Revelation, we realize this principle, this characteristic of the female donkey is what's being emphasized to us. The lion quality is being attributed to Yeshua, the Messiah. But the donkey quality... <laughs> Sorry, it's being attributed to us because it keeps saying, here's the patience of the saints. Here's the patience of the saints. Rest a little while. Here's a, here's a nice robe. Rest a little while. In fact, there's silence in heaven. It says for about the space of half an hour. It's emphasizing on the part of the saints a quality of patience has been acquired by that point. We have taken on the nature of the female donkey. And then how can you tell her offspring? How can you tell, identify the cult of this donkey? The one who is patient, the one who is ever flowing, the one who is permanent, the one who is enduring. Well, it's just like the prophecy of Jacob says about Judah. You can tie that cult to a vine because it's going to act contrary to its nature. The nature it has taken on is the nature of its mother. And in the book of Revelation, you see this quality reflected. There's two women that go into the wilderness. One's the harlot, 
And she's also spoken to as Jezebel in the message to the assembly at Thyatira, where it says, not just she, but she and her children, they will be thrown onto a sick bed. Why? Because the children have the same characteristics as she does. She's leading them into idolatry and they are committing idolatry with her, spiritual adultery. So we know the mother by the children. It's the trial of the sota. Remember, if the mother's innocent when she drinks the bitter water, then she's going to bear children. And the children are her testimony of purity. Well, with Jezebel, with the scarlet harlot, her children are the testimony to her adultery. But with this other woman, her children are a reflection that they are indeed her seed. It takes us back to the paleo prophecy of the seed of the woman. How do we know that these are the children of the virtuous woman? Their characteristics, other than having the patience of the female donkey, it says they keep the testimony of Yeshua and the commandments of God. So the proof is in the cult tied to the vine. The proof is in those children exhibiting the patience and that ever-flowing stream of water that they learned from their mother. And therefore, they do have the patience to be tied to the vine until the lion stands up, until we start to see that other aspect of Messiah that's prophesied. Um, we can see this even in Yeshua's mother, it, it, which... You know, I know it's the most wonderful time of the year for a lot of people, but at least it's giving us some context here for the, you know, Mary riding on the donkey, uh, which uh, <laughs> I saw something really hilarious. I mean, it was Christmas oriented, but just kids' misperceptions of what actually is said in the Gospels because Christmas has so interfered you know, with the actual context of what's happening. But uh, with Mary, without getting into the Christmas spirit here, we know that Mary had prophecy applied to her, and then she becomes a prophet. In fact, I, I, I hope I'm not the only one that's ever looked at this big, long speech Mary gives <laughs> and wondered, like, what does that mean? <laughs> What's she talking about? <laughs> but then it, it starts to make sense when you put her prophecy back into the context of these blessings that are placed on the tribes. Because if our king is going to come in riding on a donkey, it tells you he has that nature of his mother. And not just the mother, the Holy Spirit, but even his physical Mother, the mother who gave birth to him, because she gives you clues. In Luke, she says, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. Now put yourself in her position. On a lot of days, we're more afraid of what people think than of executing the will of the Father. And when you're as young as she probably was, and living in the culture that she was, the idea of becoming pregnant without first consummating her marriage would have been horrifying. You realize the worst that could happen was not just, you know, somebody put it on Facebook. There were severe consequences to an adulteress because she's already considered married, even though it's not been consummated. And if Joseph doesn't get the same vision, things could go south pretty fast. Plus, people are always going to talk. They still talk. In fact, there's still a tradition that um, Yeshua was fathered by a Roman soldier. That's still one of the myths surrounding his birth. And so when Mary says, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word, that's definitely being willing to be tied to a vine. Because she never outlived the accusations. You realize that? Would you sign up for that? Would you sign that check? 
if that check said you will never outlive the gossip and the looks and the accusations and basically being eaten for dinner by people who are supposed to be righteous and godly people, but she does it. And then uh, she says, my soul, my soul, my nefesh, exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. How can that happen? Her soul can exalt the Lord because her spirit has rejoiced. Her spirit is dictating what her soul does. Because I guarantee you, if your ass isn't tied to the vine with that sort of information, your soul's not going to be exalting the Lord. It's going to be scared to death. It's going to be frozen in a state of fear, if anything. We've never walked in her sandals, so I don't think we get this was a lifetime ahead of her of always being perceived as an adulterous woman. She says, for he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. She's saying, I'm nothing. I'm just a humble bond slave. I'm the aton. I'm the female donkey. In Luke, she says, he, Adonai, has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. So she's verifying for us this blessing placed upon Judah. That it's those who were humbled who will one day become the lions. You're not a lion first. You're a donkey first. You're a chamor. You're a redeemed jackass. You're an aton. You're a patient, perpetually flowing stream of a female ass. And you're a young colt. Against everything your senses are telling you, you patiently exhibit the characteristics of your parents, the redeemed one, the one redeemed by the lamb, who actually was the lamb, and then that spiritual ever-flowing stream of water, your mother. And so what do you have? You have someone that's full of the Spirit, someone that's redeemed by a lamb, and because of that, no matter what's going on around you, you stay tied to that vine, Yeshua, and you don't move. You don't dig ditches with your hooves. You don't tie knots in the rope. You don't eat all the leaves. You don't kick people or bite at people when they go by. You just patiently stand there as long as it takes for the lion to rise up. You become like the blessing on Issachar because he's described as a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. And see, in Issachar, you can see the shepherd nature of the donkey, the one who is protective of the sheep. He doesn't attack his own sheep. Why? Because he's creating a resting place, it says. He saw that a resting place was good and that the lamb was pleasant. And we tend to think, well, he just he's trying to make it easy on himself. And I don't think that's what it's saying. He says he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens and became a slave at forced labor. What does that mean? He's making the resting place for the sheep. He's trying to make a pleasant place for the sheep. That's what a shepherd does. He bears the burdens for the sheep. And so he's willing to be that humble servant in order to protect the congregation. And if you get a chance, take a look at last night's recordings so that you can see that the sheep are defined in Scripture as Israel whether you're in this fold here or whether you're those sheep that are scattered out there among the nations that Yeshua refused to forget and to leave out there. He was David, the son of David, 
the shepherd that was going to regather those sheep as the seventh shepherd. And the moral of that story is if we're going to be like Issachar, a different donkey, but see, his name means rewards or wages. And if we can do this, there is a reward. We don't do it because there's a reward. We do it in order to make a resting place for sheep. But there will be a reward associated with being a resting place for the sheep. And that's the question. Are we safe places for sheep to dwell? Yeshua kept asking Peter, do you love me? He didn't ask Peter, do you think you're right on this doctrinal issue? And do you believe you're pronouncing my name correctly? That's not what he asked. He said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That's what he wants to know, because when you love him, you will protect the sheep. You will tend the sheep. You'll take care of the lambs. And you'll pasture the sheep. It's giving them pasture. It's creating that resting place that's good, that pleasant place for them to dwell. Because life is hard as a sheep. It ain't easy. There's all sorts of predators out there. And there's dry places. And there's rocky places. And you get stones in your hooves or whatever sheep have. And you get cockleburs in your fur. And you have fights with other sheep in the flock. Those things happen to sheep. But can we be a donkey? Can we be patient? Can we have an ever-flowing stream of the Spirit running through us? And can we be a safe place for sheep to dwell? Whatever our little congregation may be, you might be part of a huge congregation. You might be part of a tiny congregation. Or this might be the only congregation that you have because you're just not close to anywhere or anybody that believes or does the way that you do. Whoever your congregation is, are you a resting place and are you making this place pleasant for the sheep? Are you Issachar? Are you a strong donkey that can just lie down between the sheepfolds? And if you see danger coming, you'll say so. But you won't be running through the flock kicking and biting the sheep. A donkey doesn't do that. The donkey kicks and bites coyotes, wolves, bears, <laughs> small children <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but he doesn't attack the sheep. And that's what we have to be. We have to take these blessings of Judah, the blessings of Joseph, the blessings of Issachar, of all 12 tribes, those blessings are ours too. We share in them because we are one Israel. He says there's going to be one flock with one shepherd. No matter how divided they look now, they will be one flock with one shepherd. And it says then the nations will come before him. They'll pass before him. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And I guarantee you he's going to be able to separate the Yisachars and the Judas from the wild Ishmaels who just want to kick and bite and run wild, who weren't safe places for the sheep. And that's what we have to be. We have to be a safe place for one another whether we're going through small tribulations or great tribulations, we have to operate within the blessings of those names. 